Super pumped to have the gorgeous Bryony Benjamin with me, who is a keynote speaker, author, and storyteller whose viral videos have been viewed by more than 200 million sets of eyeballs. Her own story went global after she documented her journey from cancer diagnosis to recovery in the video, You Only Get One Life. And this led to her book called Life is Tough, But So Are You, and a passionate drive to help individuals face the toughest times of their lives with more ease and less fear. And we'll be tapping into a bit of this today and an exciting new project for her. So welcome, Bryony. Thank you, Julie. It's so lovely to be here with you. Oh, it's amazing to have you. And I'm really keen to get into our chat. So I'd love to get started. So my first question is, if you were leader of the world for a day, what would be the three things that you would do? Well, Julie, I have been a passionate environmentalist since I was about four. Mm, okay. <laughs> when I was in like pre-primary school. And for me, you know, I think growing up in a vet practice, uh, being around nature and caring for animals and wild animals always it just made sense to me that if we don't look after the planet, uh, then what have we got left, you know? Mm. Uh, and particularly having been through a major health crisis myself, you know, it really does get you thinking about issues of health and well-being and our, our environment more. At least it did for me, you know. Ultimately, if our skies are polluted, if our oceans are polluted, um, we're not very healthy, you know, and yeah. indigenous culture in Australia, you know, they say if we have sick earth, we have sick people. And so for me, it's always been about climate. And I remember at a really young age coming across the climate crisis and just thinking, well, once everyone knows about this, surely uh, we'll get this fixed straight away, right? <laughs> and so I, um, you yeah, I've spent a lot of my career working with environmental groups and climate groups, trying to help communicate and bring people along. Because I think for the most part, as people, we're all pretty similar. We all want the same things, but we're overwhelmed, confused, you know, or maybe just head in the sand. It feels too hard. But I think when people feel hopeful and empowered and like they can do something, you know, they're happy to get involved. And so I actually spent the last year working with the you know, well, we call them now like the teal independents doing comms and content with Climate 200. And that, I've got to say, is one of the best projects I've ever worked on, uh, just ultimately helping get some really incredible people into the parliament, you know, and mm. all, <laughs> I think put the women in charge. Uh, and so, yeah, if I was leader of, 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 is it of the world or of the country? The world. The world, yeah. I would just, um, you know, I know it's not an easy task, but work out how can we get everyone, uh, all the countries around the world to work out the best plan to rapidly reduce our emissions and start regenerating this beautiful planet that we live on. You know, it is our one planet. So for me, that's probably the big overarching one. Um, and the second one would just be, you know, 50% of women in power all over the world. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? You know, so many countries, we see what's happening in Iran right now. I mean, it's it's unfathomable um mm. yet you know this was a country that was um you know is, is not too dissimilar to us in so many ways you know um so it's been heartbreaking watching what's been happening there so I think yeah more women in power more, more diversity in power um and and to get action on climate immediate and drastic action that's what I'd be focusing on <laughs> yeah yeah I think you'd have a lot of people nodding their heads at your response there on all of them actually because um you know my hope I mean, it would be just so good if, if if someone in government could lead this and lead it really strongly around the climate because it's just it's just not happening at the moment. I don't yeah. think anyone's taking it serious enough. There's a lot of noise, but um, and I know it is a big task, like you say. But it's like, come on, let's yeah. make something really happen. Yeah, you know, and and Australians do really care about this issue. You know, mm -hmm. there are millions and millions of Australians who, are, you know, the vast majority of Australians, I think it's in the order of 80%, want action on climate. They want to see things happening. And I think that was the really hopeful thing that came out of the last election with, you know, seven new climate-focused independents being elected to the parliament, mm. uh, you know, and, and the amazing David Pocock, the former Wallabies captain who now has 
you know, one of the most pivotal roles in the Senate. He sort of has the deciding vote or, you know, the government needs his support to pass Mm -hmm. things. You know, we're, we're seeing these really incredible people step up and say, look, I'm not a career politician. I I don't necessarily know how the parliament works, but these are the things I stand for. This is what my community actually wants rather than big vested interests and what the party mm. wants. So let's get cracking. And they've, they've really, you know, we've finally passed some ambitious climate legislation in this country that the independents were able to help strengthen. And so for the first time in a really long time, in an Australian context anyway, I'm feeling really hopeful it's the most hopeful I've felt in a really long time. So that's nice, at least. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that is really nice. Absolutely. So we share similar but different game-changing moments in our lives. So I'd love to tap into yours a little bit because it's, you know, you're much further down the track than what I am. And I'd love to understand on reflection what did you learn about you when you were going through all of that? So many things, Julie, as mm. I'm sure, you know, you understand. I mean, I suppose I I wrote a book about it in the end because there was so much I wanted to share and so much I'd learned. But ultimately, there's nothing like the shake-up call of a cancer diagnosis is there to make sure, uh, you know, are you really doing what you want to be doing with this precious short time you get on earth? And so I think for me it really did bring me back to, strangely, lots of things I'd been really passionate about as a child and had maybe gotten a bit distracted from, you know. It's sort of like it's not so much about finding the new you but it's almost going back to who you really are, I, I have found, um, you know, kind of coming home in a way. And so for me, well, as we were discussing, you know, thinking about the climate, the planet, uh, whilst I couldn't really engage with those things when I was unwell because, you know, you're in survival mode, right, and you're focusing just on getting better and getting out of that, definitely as I started to emerge out of it, um, it's been it's been the big thing. And, you know, it's like I sort of relate the idea of the planet and our bodies and how we treat, how many of us are treating our bodies is really reflected in that macro of how we're treating the planet in Western culture. And this idea that if someone gets a cancer diagnosis, we don't just say, oh, well, bad luck, you know. And so we shouldn't be doing that with our environment, no matter how dire things seem as well. You know, it's like we throw everything that we've got at it. Mm. And there's always hope, I think. And so that was a really big takeaway from it. Another one was just that women are just freaking awesome. <laughs> like the women in my life were <laughs> just so amazing. The way they turned up, showed up. My mother was extraordinary. My sisters were wonderful, you know, as were lots of the men in my life too, but the women were really amazing. And, yeah, I think just having a lot of time uh, to reflect and think, you know, I always joke that I'd prefer to go to a yoga retreat in Bali next time, but, you know, yeah. that works too. <laughs> um, but I think definitely a much, much bigger uh, appreciation for the little things in life. People always say it and it almost sounds token and trite, you know, but you do. You realise that actually the moment you're in right now, the experiences you're having right now, Nothing actually matters more than that. That's all we have. Nothing else is a given. We don't know what's coming. But I definitely take much more time to be present, to enjoy it in the moment and call it out in the moment. You know, it's not even like reflecting at the end of the day. I'll be like in the moment, how good is this? You know, how amazing is this? Because even on our worst days, I think our lives in this country, particularly for so many of us, are better than some people's best ever day will be. You know, we are so unbelievably blessed Mm. and and it was really that learning of even in my toughest challenges um you know in the depths of chemo and sickness it was there was always something to be so grateful for you know even the fact that I could have chemotherapy you know I thought wow how lucky am I that I can actually have it you know that my body is strong enough to be able to take it you know not everyone gets that option Mm. How, how fortunate that I can do IVF that I have time how fortunate that you know, I live in a country that we're, where we have a healthcare system that can support me through this. Mm. So as we know in America, largest number one cause of bankruptcy, healthcare costs. It's just mad. Mm. And I think, you know, we have to protect that right for Australians 
because it, these things are not just a given, you know, and I think we've got to be so careful that we don't go down that slippery slope of America and, you you know, you end up in a country where, you know, I had a girlfriend who was over there doing her med training and she got reprimanded for going to help someone while they're having a heart attack outside the hospital, you know. She, she got told off and reprimanded because they weren't someone that had insurance with her hospital and I just thought, wow, you, we just never want our country to get to that point, you know. Mm, absolutely. I can't believe that. That's crazy. But you are right. We are very lucky in terms of the healthcare that we do have here. And, um, you know, you received a stage four um, diagnosis, which must have been like so confronting. And then going through that brutal, the brutality of chemo, it's just, you know, um, digging into your strength and resilience on a, on a whole other level. And um, I love what you said in terms of being really grateful for being in the moment and you call that out in the moment. Um, I'd love to understand, like, is that something that you've learned along the way to be able to do? Is that um, is that is it a practice that you have practiced, if you like? Yeah. Because um, I'm a big reflector probably at the end of the day or at the start of the day, but it's like hmm, how do you do that in the moment? Because that would be so beneficial for um, everyone listening no matter what and, yeah, and do they know, do. I think it's something I'd always sort of done but it really just, tightened during that Mm. and I'm really fortunate to be with a partner now this beautiful man who is he's exactly the same and we're we're both really similar in that regard so you know because you know my sisters used to tease me when I was younger but yeah okay we get it it's a beautiful day you know (laughs) but whereas he is worse than me like he's more oh my gosh how good is this day how lucky are we you know and so I think that's lovely to have that um, with, you know, a friend or a partner or someone around you because you, you kind of bring it out in each other. Mm. Uh, but and because I, I, I remember too uh, listening to The Resilience Project, listening to the audio book by Hugh Van Cyclenberg and, and he talks about a student that he taught and he would just always in the moment go, this, this, meaning, you know, how good is this? Look at this, you know. Be, and this was a, a, a student that was in one of the poorest schools in India living out in the middle mm. of the desert who literally had nothing but it was just pure joy. And and he said the more his research resilience, actually he was joyful because he was someone that was appreciating those things in the moment. It actually strengthens those resilience muscles, you know, when you're constantly reiterating and scanning for the good. Um, and it's a big part of what I learned recently with um, a course that I did called The Lightning Process. When, when you've been dealing with chronic, I, I did it for my chronic fatigue, and when you've been dealing with a chronic illness or chronic fatigue for a long time, we get very, very good at editing for the bad. Mm. So we look back on a day and it might have been 80% great, but we're thinking about the time we felt nauseous, the time our neck was hurting, the time we felt really fatigued. And so when you go back each day to this course, they get you just to reflect on the wins and the, and the times you felt great. You're not allowed to say, oh, but then I did this and then I, you know, and that was really helpful. And and on the first day, uh, Liz, who I did it with, she said to me, so, Bryony, how long have you been feeling like you're feeling? And I said, oh, look, it's been about five years since chemo and then maybe another two years before that, so about seven years, thinking she'd say, oh, you poor thing, you know, you've been <laughs> feeling sick for seven years. And she said, wow, so you've been really well for 80% of your life. And I just burst into tears because I realised that I didn't see myself as a well person anymore. I saw myself as a really sick and unwell person. And she sort of reminded me of the overwhelming health and well-being of my entire life, you know, that this is actually, this is a blip in the scheme of it. And Mm. I think, you know, rewire, and it's, so it was all about rewiring to scan for the good and rewiring those neural pathways that light up when we're just focusing on the negative that reiterate it and make it all worse. So it's really mm. powerful stuff. Mm, yeah. That's so interesting. That's yeah, as you say, that is such a powerful story and such a massive distinction in terms of just simply flipping it to say, hey, you were well for 80% of your life. Wow. That's mm. yeah. I'm so gonna look into that lightning therapy, oh the gosh, lightning process. I, it's like I've come out of a cult. Like honestly, everyone <laughs> I t- I <laughs> I meet, I'm like, oh, you got to do the lightning process, you know. But I think for physical things, for emotional things, for anxiety, depression, you can do it for a whole lot of things. But, yeah, it was through. They said at the start of the course, these will be three of the most important days of your life. And I thought, that's a big call. But it, but it absolutely was. I can say 
hand on heart after doing it. It was, it was transformative. It's helped um, me so much with my healing. Oh, that's so good. Cause I, you know, at the start of my journey, um, you know, we connected briefly and then I got a copy of your book and I found that to be incredibly inspiring for me and really, really helpful. And oh, so I went on a bit of a journey in terms of really searching for really inspiring stories, which uh, when you're looking for it, there is no shortage of inspiring people everywhere yeah. who, yeah. you know, in in – have, who have been through a lot worse than what you have, to be honest. In, yeah, totally. And, yeah, so it really framed my mindset to be looking for those inspiring stories and understanding that, hey, you really haven't got it that bad. I, I, I could have obviously done some better work on my mindset there. But was there, I mean, you you sound like you're quite wired to be looking for the positive in things, but that would do you think there's a particular mindset that you did adopt um, while you were going through your challenge? You know, was it that you allowed more people in to help you? Did you ask for help? Um, you know, what was it for you? Yeah, look, so many things. I, I I feel like I've probably always been a bit of a positive bunny, but early on I thought, yeah, you know, I'm going to be so positive and I'm just going to smash this and I'm going to be the most positive cancer patient that ever there has been. And I realized early on that that was actually very unhelpful. I went and saw a psychologist and she just sort of said to me, hey, um, I just want to let you know, you don't have to like any of this. You don't have to look for silver linings. You can hate this whole thing if you want. This is really tough. Mm. And for me, I thought, well, I don't want to hate this whole thing and just wallow in it and that's going to make it really hard for me. But it did release a pressure valve knowing that, okay, I don't have to be like Pollyanna the whole way through this and I'm actually, it's healthy to feel what I feel and just sit with it. Mm. And so that was a big learning early on. And also just the mindset of a girlfriend shared, which I share in the book, the idea of some things don't have to be understood, just accepted. So leaning into that acceptance piece early on, I wish this wasn't happening. Um, yeah, I I wish this wasn't part of my life, but it is. And every minute I stew over why me or how long and who, mu who mucked up and didn't, you know, why has yeah. this happened? It's just so much wasted energy. Mm. And so I think letting, yeah, it's that balance of, you know, I think everything in life is balance, but it's that balance of wanting to survive, doing everything that you can, putting all your energy into surviving, but also this, this, yeah, balance between that and also, but there's so much out of my control here. All I can do is take it day by day, do my best, you know, ask for help. Like you said, that was a big thing. A girlfriend shared with me early on, she, she'd had a brain tumor. I'd never even realized we played sport together. And she said, I just wanted to say, just lean on your people right now. They really want to help. And you'll get your time down the track to help them, you know, but just let people help you. And that was helpful for me because I think otherwise, even though I was starting chemo and going through all this, I wanted to still prove to everyone that I was awesome and could do it and was really tough and I didn't I didn't need, you know, help. So mm. I think, yeah, it's just you just it's what life's about at the end of the day, right? Leaning on people when you need them and vice versa. You you'll yeah. get your chance <laughs> to help others later on. So yeah, great advice from your friend there. Yeah. So, um, so now you have a new project, which I'm really excited to share with my um, listeners for you, and that is that you've released a journal to accompany your gorgeous book. And I just want to also say that um, your book is so relevant for people not only if they're going, you know, that they've received a life-threatening diagnosis, it's for any disruption in their life. It can be, you know, relationship um, ending or, you know, losing their job, whatever that might be. But any disruption, I think it's really, really powerful. So you found journaling very, very helpful for you. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what's happening now? Yeah. So, as you said, journaling for me really became absolutely critical when I was going through treatment. 
Mm. I started a practice known as the morning pages. Basically, you just get up and you write what's on your mind and you just get it out of your head and you put it on paper. And the idea is that over time, it really helps you clarify your thoughts, gives you direction. But if nothing else, it's actually just um, this idea of just clearing the cloud out of your head and, and putting it somewhere you know, mm. and, and acknowledging that these are just thoughts. They're not you. They don't define you. They're just the thoughts that are going through your mind right now. So there's no right or wrong way to do it. You know, you can whinge and moan for pages if you want. You can, <laughs> uh, maybe it's more of a brain dump and a to-do list, but it's just whatever comes. There's no right or wrong way to do it. And so I did it every day for, you know, the 12 weeks that I was going through chemo and then a bit beyond as well. And yeah, I found it incredibly therapeutic, but it wasn't until after I finished chemo that I learned a bit more about journaling when I was researching it. And and the science is pretty clear that, you know, people uh, bounce back and are more resilient following traumatic events when they're journaling, like even wounds can heal faster, some research to suggest. And because it's sort of like, you know, it's all that mind-body connection, I think as well. It's giving your brain a direction. It's giving it's giving it clarity, it's just taking that stress out of your body and out of your mind and putting it somewhere. And so, yeah, it was something that I love doing. So I'm really thrilled to be in January releasing a companion journal to go with the book because I've had a lot of people as well reach out that, that say, oh, I love the book but I don't want to mark it and I don't want to, like, colour it in because it's so pretty. And I'm like, thank you. Uh, but, yeah, so the <laughs> journal has big chunks of space to write in and then lots of little journaling prompts and, you know, full-page quotes. And so some of the ideas from the book to really step you through from, whoa, this has just happened Mm. through to the other side and and you know I sort of like to describe it as your best friend in a book mm. but that really awesome best friend you know the one that turns up and they, they've brought gin and snacks and you know <laughs> um and they clean up after themselves and they go home before you're over them uh, that kind yeah. of friend you know not the friend that overstays their welcome and the yeah videos. um that's been there done that and you know, with humour and lightness is like, we're going to get through this. It's going to be okay, but not in that toxic kind of just be positive, you'll Mm. be fine kind of way where you kind of want to strangle people when they say that, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You're stronger than you think. Yeah, 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 Yeah. exactly. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. God moves in mysterious ways. So Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Thanks for that. Yeah. So you recommend doing it in the morning? Yeah. I mean, it's whenever it works for you really. Okay. Uh, for me, the idea about what I liked in the morning is it becomes kind of a brain dump as opposed to, dear diary, this is what happened today kind of thing. Yeah. You find at the end of the day it can just become a log of what happened that day, whereas in the morning you're quite fresh, you know, your thoughts are, uh, and even for me, I mean, during chemo I was up very early every day because the drugs, you know, make it hard to sleep. So it was a nice thing to kind of tick off first thing in the morning, gave you a little feeling of accomplishment, like you'd, you know, gotten gotten a goal achieved, but you can do it whenever. It's about finding when it works for you. But definitely, yeah, my preference is doing it in the morning when the day hasn't yet clouded you. And it's just, just you know, Julia Cameron, the woman that first sort of created the concept of morning pages, she said she describes them as spiritual windshield wipers, which I really liked, you know, mm. and what a lovely practice as part of the morning just to go, okay, all this mess of thoughts that are racing around, we're just going to Wipe yeah. that, fresh day, let's go. Yeah, get it out on paper. Yeah. And and the funny thing I find when I'm journaling is it's really hard to lie. It's actually yeah. really hard. I don't know what it is. Like it's I find it impossible. And so there's this weird thing when the when the rubber hits the road, when the pen hits the paper, you can't, you know, you, you're really honest with yourself. You can kind of convince yourself of things in your mind, but when you come to write it, you're like, well. Yeah, that this is how I'm actually feeling. Mm. And, and, and did I, you? Sorry. Keep oh, going. sorry. I was just going to say. I think as well, it's a really good place for if you don't yet feel ready to share with other people, or you're not yet ready to talk it out loud. It's a really good way to practice and and have somewhere else for those thoughts and ideas to go, particularly ones that are just feel too dark or too embarrassing, or you just you're just not ready to share. Yeah. Like okay. Person. Yeah. 
Yeah, that makes sense because it's like, okay, I'm not ready to say this out loud, but I've got to get this out of my head because it's just yeah. running around and creating a whole heap of drama and darkness. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, and sorry to go on about the lightning process again, but what I loved about it so much is it is a process and they give you a little process for whenever something happens and uh, they call it going into the pit, but it's basically the idea. It might be a physical symptom. So for me, it might be my neck flaring up or, you know, headache or whatever, or it might be an anxious thought or worrying about something. And they say the pit is just anything that is not life enhancing. And that's then when you implement the process. So, uh, you know, and I think that's a great question to ask yourself if you're running, oh, you know, sometimes you just like to entertain different thoughts and you're, you're, you know, running off in your mind. But I think it's a great thing to ask. It's just, is this life enhancing? No. Mm. Okay. Well, then I need to stop this thought in its, in its tracks. Yeah. Give you a little system to do that. So yeah, I found that helpful. Yeah, really helpful. And did you give yourself a time limit in terms of doing it or it was just like some days it was like, you know, an hour, other days it was like two minutes? With the journaling, yeah. Mm. I mean, I find if you're going to do sort of two to three pages, uh, yeah, it's normally about 30 minutes for me. But mm. also I just think whatever you can do, you know, it's better better to write for five minutes than nothing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's the yeah. dailiness of it. And I think too when then the book came up, the book deal came up, it had just reconnected me with my love of writing and I went, oh, yeah, I could write a book because I, you know, had written pages and pages and pages and so it had sort of unlocked something. And this process has been attributed with unlocking some great uh, creatives throughout time, you know, huge novel novels and screenplays and mm. all sorts of things um, because it just, you know, it's kind of like doing your – your creative stretches in a way. So, you know, for people that are maybe wanting to write a book or or become a writer one day, I, I would really recommend it as well just as a, a daily practice to get into. Yeah, I love that. I've always struggled with journaling. Um, for some reason I just could never get myself into the flow of it. Mm. Um, of course, you know, when you diagnose, I need to get some thoughts out here, particularly the bad ones. But I did it at night. So it was, it did become a bit of a dear diary thing. So um, I'm a massive fan of morning routine. So perhaps I should yeah, incorporate I wonder. Even that. if it was 20 minutes, I wonder, wonder yeah. what that would be like. Yeah. Exactly. I wonder. No, uh, my friend Christina Carlson, who was the founder of Kiki yeah. K, She's a mad journaler mm. and, and she starts her day every day with morning pages. Mm. And a lot of, yeah, a lot of really successful people do. It's one of those interesting, you know, something synergies in it. with people. Yeah, there's something in it. So, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Awesome. So I'll be sharing all of the links to um, buy Bryony's book and her journal and get in touch with her in the show notes. So it's been so Wonderful to chat to you today, and um, the time's gone so quickly. Hasn't it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but you know, is there a final message that you'd love to, you know, share with our listeners today? Oh, so many things. One message is hard, <laughs> but I think, um, you know, can I share maybe maybe a micro one and a macro one? So, in terms of a micro one, I mean, for me, the message of the book really like. The title really does sum it up. Life is tough, but so are you. And I actually think life is beautiful and wonderful and incredible. I don't think it's tough, but it can be tough, you know. Mm. There are some really tough things that we're all going to have to do. But as the title of the book says, you know, but so are you. Yeah. You actually, it's extraordinary the depths and the resilience you already have in, in you that you might not even realise yet, you know. Mm. You, really can, you really can face anything that comes your way. And then... Yeah, on on, and I think in terms of helping others that are going through a tough time, you know, I write about it in the book because I think it is. It's just we don't know necessarily how to help sometimes. But I think, and, you know, I'd be interested in your take on this, Julie, but I know most people, you know, they, they don't want to be told what to do. They don't really want to be given advice. They just want to be listened to. They want to know they're loved, they're supported, and, you know, uh, just do practical things, drop meals around, give people the option, can I do this or this, you know? Uh, don't be one of those people that says, I'll do anything because you're just never going to, it just 
creates a burden for the person. You're never going to ring someone up and say, hey, can you do this? Or you might, if you can, full props to you, but I found that hard. So just doing things, you know, just doing things and being thoughtful is really, really wonderful. Um, and then, yeah, on a on a more macro scale, I think uh, the the issues that face the world can seem really overwhelming sometimes, but I have found the antidote to that is just to do something, <laughs> kind of like helping out your friend, you know. It's just doing something. And I love the expression, get active, not anxious, you know. Yes. So that might look like starting a, a, a community group that sits around and asks, what do we actually want? What's the vision for our community? What do we want, you know? And maybe, you know, like so many of these communities are doing now, getting a candidate up and, you know, going for it. And and I've met some of the most extraordinary people through doing that. You know, when you're doing things that are aligned and you, it can actually be a whole lot of fun. I think we have this misconception that it's hard and it's going to be draining, but actually the best people I've met in my life have been through doing that sort of purpose-led work. So yeah, get active, not anxious, be it on a small scale or a big scale. Yes, I love that. And focus on what you can control, not what you can't control. 100%. And um, yeah. And I absolutely love your advice um, to people um, for those who are going through something. So I 100% endorse that because, yeah, I'm a bit like you. I'm not going to ask someone to necessarily, hey, can you drop a meal around tonight? But um, if they just do it, that was the absolute best thing for me. So perhaps they had read your book and um, and, um, listened to your advice. So, Bryony, it's been a pleasure and I just want to thank you for being the leader that you are and for making such a difference for so many people um, on, you know, locally but also on on a global scale as well. So I really appreciate your time today. Oh, thank you. It's been a total privilege to sit and have a beautiful chat with you. So thanks for having me on. Thank you.